The law, the law, the law. I wrote down some key words from this, from this video segment here for you guys uh, of what they've said. Number one, someone said, you all, are, you all are so good at all of this. That was Mary. She said, you guys are all good at doing this. Someone responds, your nose is in the writings, the scriptures, to which one responds, sometimes not as good as others. I really want to be a good student. Show of hands who said that when you guys are going to school. Uh, I thought so. <laughs> I don't think any of us did well or went to school. That's why all of this is so surprising to us. I didn't like all the rules. Someone responds, I was always a, ruler, a rule follower. How many of those are you? Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Show of hands. Wow, we don't have very many of those. All right. One time I had meat with cheese just so I could see what I was missing. And you heard him what he said. He goes on to say, forget the guilt. I was sick for days. I haven't violated a single food rule since. Probably thought about karma there. Someone jokes, I tried pork once. Someone says, I've grown to love being Jewish and I've grown to love following the law, but it can be exhausting. So what do you think we're talking about today? The law. The law. It's almost like the claw, you know, from that movie. No. Uh, you know, when I, when I thought about the, the, the passage that we're going to go through today, the first thing I thought in my, that came to my mind as I was praying was back in 2015, Erica and I came back to Fremont after the, the military, and, and I went on a, a spending spree. I, I bought a lot of stuff. And I was constantly, every year, you guys know this if you're a regular tenant, every year I was buying a new car. My friend bought one. It's like, man, I'm going to one-up you. I'm going to get a bigger truck. You have bigger tires? I'm going to get one with bigger tires. I didn't care. I had that military money. Good paying job. Eric was working, had a, a good paying job also. So why save? Why, why put money towards debt when I can splurge on myself? Fast forward a couple years when we found out we were having our first daughter, Zoe. And I found myself laying in bed thinking... All right, first I was supposed to take care of my wife. Now I have a wife and a daughter, but we can't make ends meet. I can't pay for rent. I'm struggling. We're barely making our cell phone payments. We have no money left over. Through the course of being in scripture, the Lord quickly convicted me that I had to let go of possessions. How many of you guys have been there where you know the Lord is saying, hey, you got to let that go, and you're like, how about this but not this? For instance, like I was reading one of my devotions and it said at some point in your life, God will always call you to get rid of something, and the first thing that popped in my mind was two things, to sacrifice during Lent. Cable, Tom, and then the word, your motorcycle came to mind. I said, absolutely not. Cable it is. <laughs> There's times God calls us to get rid of stuff, and so he was calling me to get rid of my truck. And I could justify it. I could say, hey, you could borrow my truck, Cindy, to move. Hey, you can use my truck to go somewhere if you need it. I need this truck, God, because I'm using it for others. Guess how long that went? Not very far. So I take my truck in, easiest way. You go to a dealership and say, hey, I'm willing to surrender my truck. What do I need to pay? As I looked up uh, what my truck could go for, I'm like, oh, this is good. We'll barely have to pay anything. Go to it, show him my truck. He comes back with a very large difference <laughs> in my loan and what he's willing to offer me for my truck. I'm sitting there thinking, that's over, over seven grand. I don't have that money. What am I going to do, God? Keep making this payment that's well over $600? I don't know what to do. I go to my job at the time. I say, hey, I need to work more hours. I need some more hours. Obviously, you know I have a child on the way. And because of my flesh, I've gotten us into some trouble financially. Graciously, my boss says, hey, you can have some more hours. So I'm doing the hours not helping. 
And this is years ago, I wasn't making very much. And uh, I, was sitting, I was sitting at my table eating supper one night, and I got a text, and I'm one of those guys, that if my phone goes off, I'll stop eating and go look. That's not good. Um, I pull up my phone, and, and I kid you not, my boss texts and says, hey, if you and Erica need help, I'm willing to cover the difference in your truck and your loan. Crazy. Now, I will tell you that though he covered it, he did make us pay it back. But the difference between paying a, a 7% loan and, and having this large payment, he said, you can pay me back when you have it. Do you know what went through my body there? Emotion, freedom. Where there was no way where we were struggling financially. I was struggling to provide for my family. I was thinking, Lord, what am I supposed to do? This is what I've put myself in this position, but Lord, I'm crying out now because I've made a mess of my life. When there was no way, God shows up and he provided a way for us to move forward as a family, and I had freedom. And I thought about this message in this passage, and I, I, I was talking to a congregant last week who called me and about last week's message and, and what the Lord's ministering to her. And, and I said, you know what? I don't know why God is having me preach some of the messages he's having me preach. I, I don't know why God is having me preach some hard messages. For last week, some of you guys probably left feeling overwhelmed. Some of you guys probably was like, well, that didn't really matter to me. But the truth of the matter is, there's many times is, since I've taken over, I'm just like, Lord, why do I have to preach this message? I told my congregant, or the congregant, I said, this is why. I've been praying about it, and the Lord said, because I'm trying to get the church to see that all, they can, uh, all that they can uh, lean on is me. I'm trying to get our church and the church at large to realize that just as the word was spoken, the time is coming. He's coming sooner than any of us think, and he's trying to wake us up as a church, as a whole, not just full life church in America, trying to wake us up to realize all we have is Jesus. So last week, for those of you who are here, we started a new sermon series called Kingdom Living. And last week we went through the Beatitudes. Be attitude. Be what I'm telling you to be. And it's Jesus starting out saying, hey, I'm going I'm to transform everything right here. I'm calling you to do the way you're supposed to live and who you're supposed to be. And last week, we talked about the first three verses, where I tried to do the rest of the verses, but ran out of time, and we just hit on sin. How there's not one good person in the world. Psalm 14 in Romans, how scripture over and over says there's not one person who's good. And I said, this, I said the statement of, if you believe you're a good person, you're anti-gospel. Because the gospel shows you that you are a sick person in need of grace. I said, my goal is to overwhelm this congregation. My goal is to have you have no hope leaving. But today, church, is a good day. Today is the reason we celebrate and gather as a church because today's message is all about the gospel. It is Jesus Christ and what he accomplished so that we are set free. So today is a celebration. I said, ah, thank you, Lord, for giving us no hope at one point to just overshowering us with your grace, your mercy, your love, and your hope because it's in Jesus Christ. So let's read our passage today. Jesus says in verse 17 in Matthew 5, don't think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish but to fulfill. That word abolish means I did not come to crush it. I didn't come to nullify. I didn't come to push it off where it doesn't matter anymore. He's saying I'm not doing that with the law. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of the letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness 
unless if your right standing surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Wow. I will remind us who he's talking to right now. Jesus is talking to the disciples. The Jewish people. The moment he said, unless if your righteousness surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees, do you know what through their mind? You're a lunatic. You're crazy. There's no way that I can surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees. There's no way that I can surpass the righteousness of the scribes. There's no way that I can be better than the people who are perfect. But Jesus is getting at something. See, church, we've got to understand what Jesus is doing for the disciples. And later on, if you, if you end the Sermon on the Mount, you'll see that there's a large crowd gathering around. See, Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, church. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. We've got to understand that there was three laws back in the day. There's the civil law. Right? How you interact with one another in, in this society. Right? So you have... Yes, the judicial laws, judicial uh, civil law. It's, it's, it relates to agriculture. The sediment of disputes, the diet, your cleanliness, the way you dress, etc. That is the judicial law. They had the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial law was everything for the people to worship God. That's what he put it in place for. It's what he had in place to help them have a right standing with him. And then you had the moral law which is the foundational Ten Commandments. So Jesus is talking about the law. There's three laws within one. And why is that important? I don't really want to stick to the notes very much because the Lord is just brewing something. But in today's society, you hear it all the time, right? Well, if you can't do this, what about this, what about this in Leviticus, right? Let me give you one of the scriptures in Leviticus if you guys want to hold to them. There is a scripture in Leviticus that says, if you and another man are fighting, your wife has permission to come alongside the other man and grab his you-know-what and pull. How many of you guys would want to do that? <laughs> Wives? That was one of the laws. You can't eat pork, right? Right? You have to pray so many times a day. There, there's so many laws, but what happened in that time, church, we got to understand this. What happened in that time was God created the law for good. God created the law to help us, well, them at the time, to be in relation with him because he knew we were humans. He knew we would fall away. He knew that we would have sinful desires. He knew we would pursue what we want to pursue rather than pursue him. And so at that time, think about it. They didn't have doctors. They didn't have scientists. They didn't have accounting people or any of that stuff. So like in Leviticus, think about this. I thought about this when I was reading this week. Man, in Leviticus he says, if you are sick with leprosy, go quarantine for 14 days. Hmm. Well, I don't know what happened last couple years. God specifically made the law to protect the people and to make sure they can remain with him. And Jesus is going to the people. You just saw in the video where they said, I love the law. The law, I love it. But it puts so much weight on me. And what Jesus is saying is, hey, I didn't come to abolish those. Let me tell you what Jesus did on the cross, guys, because we got to pay attention because you'll hear this in, out in Fremont. You'll hear it all the time if you try to evangelize about Jesus. What about X in Leviticus? Don't cut your hair. Okay, Jesus' death, in resurrection, Jesus, the way that he was the perfect lamb that was slaughtered, he did not sin. He kept all 613 laws from the Old Testament. Jesus kept every single one, so he was the perfect lamb that was slaughtered. Because of that, he, he, he did do away with the, the judicial and ceremony laws. He did away with the judicial and ceremonial laws. Those are no longer binding for us as believers. But the moral law, the Ten Commandments. Though you are not bound to the Ten Commandments in Christ, it still reigns. 
Why is that? Because it has everything to do with your heart. Everything to do with your heart. See, we like to teach the, the Sermon on the Mount as, come to Jesus, it's loving. And he is loving. And he is gracious. He is merciful. Man, he's amazing. But what Jesus is saying to his disciples right here is, here's the bar already. I'm not going down here. I'm raising it. I'm raising the commandment. I'm raising the calling to following me. I'm calling you out to show you you have to be here. And the only way you can do it, church, the only way you can do it is through Jesus Christ. It, that's what he's getting at with this. He didn't abolish the law. He's saying, I fulfill the law so you can have freedom in me. Let me show you the purpose of the law. In Galatians 3, 19 through 22, if you guys are readers, you can mark that down and go back this week and read it. Paul is so gracious to us as a writer back then for us as a church. He says, this is what it's for. Why was the law given? It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made was, would come. What Paul is saying is, hey, the whole point of the law, the whole point of the 613 laws was to help you maintain a relationship with me until I came. It wasn't to put pressure on you. It wasn't to make you do A, B, C, D, F, G, well, kind of, but it was to show you that you need a Savior. And guess what? I am the Savior. That's what Jesus is getting at with these people. And he goes on to say, Paul does in, in Galatians, the law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. The mediator would be Jesus Christ. Now, a mediator is not just for one person alone, but God is one. Is the law therefore contrary to God's promises? Absolutely not. For if the law had been granted with the ability to give life, then righteousness would certainly be on the basis of the law. What's Paul getting at? The law. It's to help you maintain a relationship with Jesus or with God as, as a Jewish and Hebrew people, is to help them maintain that right relationship. To, to go through the ceremonial law, if you sin, you have to, you have to uh, crush one of the lambs and have all this bloodshed and everything. The whole point of that was to maintain a relationship, but it was also to show you that our righteousness, when we stand before the sovereign king, there's nothing good in me to, to present a case to be with you, Jesus, other than Jesus, you yourself. It's freedom. The law was to show us that we aren't free. The law is to show us that none of us are good. The law is to show us that we're all broken, fallen people to point to the perfect. To point to the one who lived out all 613 laws of the Old Testament. So Jesus is getting out with his disciples. Church is beautiful. This is why we celebrate because Jesus is starting to make a declaration of who he is. The law, the prophets, the rest of the part of this with the prophets, Jesus is saying everything in the Old Testament. You have the Pentateuch, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That would be the law. And the prophets would be from there through the, the rest of the part of the Old Testament, which is what? What is the whole Old Testament for? To show the coming Messiah. He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. He came to bring revelation to the believer that I am this very one. Hallelujah. Right. Praise God. So what was the reasoning for that? I just told you, that's the reason. So let me just kind of use some scriptures here for you guys with Romans of, of the law. Romans 3, 21 through 24. Paul goes on to say, the righteousness of God through faith, but now apart from the law, apart from, from, apart from upholding the 613 laws of the Old Testament, the righteous of God have been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. What is he saying there? The right standing of God, the, the perfect person attested by the law, the person who showed you what the, the Ten Commandments were, the 613 laws, he proved it true and he lived it out. And the prophets pointing towards him. The righteousness of God is through faith in Christ Jesus. To all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned, 
All have fallen short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as an atoning sacrifice in his blood. Woo! Let me go on for you guys because there's a lot in my mind that's probably not making sense. Romans 9. What should we say then? Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, namely the righteousness that comes from faith. Okay, Paul is making a distinction here. But pay attention here. But Israel, right here. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not achieved the righteousness of the law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were, be, or as if it were by works. They didn't pursue it by faith. They didn't pursue it by faith. They pursued it through works. Let me go on to read it. It'll make more sense. Then he goes on in chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. I can testify about them. They have zeal for God. They have passion for God. They're living their life for God. They're speaking to people about God. They're zealous. I'm not knocking them on that. But not according to knowledge. Since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and attempted to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. That's good, church. That is why we celebrate. That is why we have life. That is why we have victory. That's why we have freedom. Because Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. Jesus Christ came to do all the work that we try to put on ourselves to make us right with God. And Jesus said, I am here to do this for you. I didn't come to abolish this. I didn't come to crush the law. I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it so that you who place your faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else shall have righteousness. Shall be right with God. Church, how many of us today, come on, let's be honest with one another. How many of us still today struggle with making us look good so that God can approve? I'm guilty of it. And if you say you aren't, you should probably go to your prayer closet. It's a natural flesh, in our flesh, we just have this desire, this, this thought process of I can go before a sovereign, righteous, holy, just king that says no one is like him, but I can clean myself up and present myself perfect and blameless before him, and he's saying, no, you can't. The only way you stand blameless before me, the only way you stand perfect before me, the only way you stand forgiven before me is by the blood of my son. And that is where forgiveness comes from, church. That's, that's his loving kindness that leads to repentance. It's because the power of the Holy Spirit, the third Godhead in the Trinity, begins this, to, to reveal to us the goodness of Jesus Christ. He reveals to us the work of Jesus Christ. But better yet, he reveals to us our sinful nature and, and need of Jesus Christ. That's why it was important to see that we're not good people outside of Jesus Christ last night or last week because if we don't believe that we are sinful fallen beings, not permanently, we don't get the righteousness of Jesus. We don't understand his goodness. It sets us free, church. I want to clarify what I just said last week when I said it's good to see yourself as a sinner. It's good to have repentance, right? I said that. I'm not afraid to admit that. I want to clarify that for you guys. Because Erica ran up to me right after this service. I, I messed up preaching. No, she didn't. 
What I meant there is it's good to see yourself as a sinner initially to see that you are broken and you need a savior. But here's the beauty of the gospel church is he doesn't leave you in the, in, the, in the miry clay. He doesn't leave you in the pit. He doesn't leave you in the mud. He takes you out of there and cleans you up and gives you victory. That's, that's the difference between Christianity and every, 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 every other world religion is this message. Every other religion says, clean yourself up, do good, be a good person, offer enough sacrifices, pray enough in the day, sing enough worship songs, do all this stuff, and then you might even become a god yourself. This is the difference. Jesus is the only way. Christianity is the only one. And it's the true one that says, you can't do anything apart from me, but if you place your faith in me, you can do everything. So there, I just want to clarify that up for you guys on that one. A couple more things. This is a short message. I love it. Don't, Weston. Clear his throat. I know what that means. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of the letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Guys, I just, wanna, I just want you guys to understand what he's saying. In the Old Testament, when, when God called out Sarah, uh, the scribes have removed, uh, it would be called a, a tittle in the King James Version, and it's just a little dash above a name. And what they do is they would remove that dash. And they would get bent out of shape. They would be like, what the heck? You guys are changing the word of God. What are you doing? And, and, and after, uh, after Sarah comes to, to, to God and, and God fulfills all the promises through her uh, that he promised her, they, they put it back in. The scribes put it back into the, to the scriptures. So Jesus is saying right here, not the smallest letter, which is like, it's the smallest letter of the Greek alphabet. Not even one stroke of the letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished. Guys, this is why the kingdom living sets us free because we believe in a God who will never perish. We believe in a God that will be forever. That is Jesus. Not only is it the written word will last forever, but the living word will last forever. And because of that, we have been set free not to worry about the things of this world. Church, I don't need to know what Hollywood is saying about America. I don't need to know what the politicians are saying about climate change. I don't need to know about politicians telling me how to run my household or how to run a school. What I need to know is what God's word has said and what it will come to pass because God's word has already fulfilled so many promises and there's just a few more left before he returns. So let me encourage you this morning, church, if you're struggling with anxiety, if you're struggling with potentially depression because of the way the world is going, if you're struggling with doubt or whatever it is, man, go to God in his word and say, Lord, you need to speak to me because I need assurance. It's God's word. It's everlasting in church. I just want to read from Isaiah 48. Isaiah 40. 48, but I'm going to kind of read a little bit more. It says in verse 1, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and announce to her that her time of forced labor is over. Her iniquity has been pardoned. Hallelujah. That's for us too because of Jesus Christ. And she has received from the Lord's hands double all of her sins. A voice of the one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make straight a highway for our God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places a plain. Just pay attention real fast. And the glory of the Lord will appear. Jesus. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Make way. A voice calling out in the wilderness. And the glory, the very image, the very presence of God will appear. And here came Jesus. Man, and all humanity together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice was crying out. Or vo a voice was saying, cry out. Another said, what should I cry out? Pay attention right here. All humanity is grass. And all its goodness is like the flower of the field. Pay attention. The grass withers, 
The flowers fade when the breath of the Lord blows on them. Indeed, the people are grass. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. Church, we don't worship a dead God. And you'll hear me say that a lot. Because we got to understand that we worship the living, true, active, redeem, redeeming God who redeems people, who forgives sins, who, 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 who pours out mercy and grace upon every single person. And here's the greatest thing. He remains forever. Amen. None compares to King Jesus. And on that day when he calls us to come home with him, we will be in celebration. We will be in eternal victory, worshiping the great I am. Hallelujah. Praise God. The other thing I want you guys to know is that this compels us to get into scripture. We might run a little bit later because of the, the, the pre, uh, prayers earlier, but I'm, I'm almost done, I promise. This lets us know as a church, believers, hear me. This is my cry for you as your shepherd. Get into God's word. Get into his holy scriptures. I don't care if it's two minutes a day. Get a Bible that is paperback and get into it and open it up. And get into it because two minutes is going to go to ten minutes. And ten minutes is going to go to fifteen. And fifteen is going to go to twenty before you're wanting an hour or even a week without wanting to put it down. And this is why. Because it points to Jesus Church, that's why I push us to get into God's word because I can only preach so long, I can only preach so much, but revelation comes Monday through Sunday. And I want to show you an example of this in Scripture. In Luke, where am I at here? Sorry, Matthew, Matthew's, I'll keep it in Matthew for you guys. Matthew 16. 13 through 20, just, I just want to read it real fast. I'm going to go really fast. I'm, I'm giving you the reference. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. So go read it when you get home. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea in Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? This is after their transfiguration. Peter, James, John saw it. So he's asking them, who, who do people say that I am? And they, this is what they said. Some are saying that you're John the Baptist. Others are saying you're Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. This is who they're calling you. They're calling you one of the greats from the past. Or maybe modern day, I'm just going to say it, maybe modern day religions like Mormonism that says he was a prophet. This is who they're saying you are. But Jesus says, look at this, but you... You. He's pointing them out. So every single one of you, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Why do I say that, church? We have believers who say that the Old Testament is not for today. But scripture says all of scripture is breathed out and for teaching and for rebuking and for reproof that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, by God through the Holy Spirit and given to revelation through the men. You, you would hear it on your campus that there are teachers who say that the Old Testament and scripture doesn't apply today. Well, I'm telling you here today, scripture does apply to today. I'm telling you today that if you don't get into God's word, you can't have full revelation of who Jesus Christ is. This is why. Peter had revelation. Peter knew that Jesus was the Messiah because he knew the Torah. Peter knew the Pentateuch. He knew the first five of the books. He knew what the prophets had said. He was a Jew. He knew who Jesus was because he knew the Old Testament. He studied it. He, he meditated on it. He, he wept over it. He knew the, the scriptures. And when the king of kings shows up before him, he says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah, not even the Pharisees or the scribes, unless of their, their, their own righteousness passes. Not even them recognize the true king, and they preached about him. 
Peter knew it. The Holy Spirit inspired Peter. He gave him revelation of realizing, Jesus, you are the lamb that's going to be slaughtered. And Jesus says, blessed are you going to be, church. It sets you free. Scripture is for us today because we will wither. We will die. But the believer who stands in the blood of Christ shall live forever. Amen. Hallelujah. The last thing I just want to say real fast is that the, this kingdom living that Jesus is calling them to. This kingdom living of, this is how I want you to live out your life after you place your faith in me. This is who I want you to be internally. Sets us free because it transforms our hearts. It transforms our hearts. That's why I'm big on sin. Because I wasn't a believer my whole life. I punished Christians. I wasn't taught this growing up. I lived my life for me. Buying trucks, buying cars, buying all the gadgets, sleeping with women, doing drugs, drinking alcohol. I did it all. I lived my life for me. Till the Holy Spirit showed me the depth of of my sin, the death of my depravity, the death of me getting it all wrong and melted the heart of stone away and gave me a heart of, of flesh and a heart of softness to say, Lord, I'm yours. From that moment on, church, that's why I'm so big. That's why our core values, one of them is living missionally because if someone didn't live missionally to preach the gospel to me, my heart would have never been changed. And that's what Jesus does with this. He's calling you, here's the standard this is what I've said in the Old Testament. This is what I gave for you, the Ten Commandments to Moses. These are the 613 laws I placed, but I'm going up here. I'm not doing away with them. I'm going up here to something that only way you can have it is through faith in me. And once you see yourself as bound and, and forgiven, bound and set free, broken and made whole, your heart won't be transformed, but the moment you go from brokenness to wholeness, your heart is set ablaze for God's kingdom. Church, this is what I want to say. God isn't looking for external cleanup. He's looking for internal cleanup. Amen. He's not looking to have you clean up on the outside. As a matter of fact, the people that came to salvation were prostitutes, drunkards, the scum of the earth. It was the people who looked good outside that didn't have salvation. It was the people on the outside that their hearts were calloused. He's not looking for internal, he's looking for external. I just have one more verse to show you guys this and then we'll be, I have an illustration and we'll be done. Are you back there, Erica? Can you put up Luke 10, 25 through, uh, 25 through 37 in the CSB? Thank you. I just want to show us this real fast, church, because it'll transform your relationship with Jesus. It'll transform the way you view sinners in the community of Fremont. It'll transform the way you view your professors who don't truly know the Lord. It'll transform everything you do for the kingdom of God. Is it up there? Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what, I'm, what must I do to inherit the uh, eternal life? Jesus says, What is written in the law? He asked him, How do you read it? So he's coming to try to trap Jesus, good luck with that one. He's coming to trap him. He's a teacher of the law. Jesus quickly flips it. See, I love Jesus' apologetics and his, like, the way he goes about some stuff. He quickly flips it and says, hey, let me tell you what is written in the law. How do you read it? Let go of your pre-thoughts pre, uh, when you come to Scripture. And the guy answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. Great. And love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus says. Uh, do this and you will live. Boom, right here. Wanting to justify himself. 
why we went back to the goodness last week of there's no one good. He's wanting to justify because he had an internal uh, revelation of I haven't done this. I haven't done this, so let me justify myself. He asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? How many of you guys do that? Someone's trying to disciple you or you get through scripture and it's like, well, who really is my neighbor? Not that person. I live in 334 North William Avenue, one, two, three, four, five, six. Who's really my neighbor? And Jesus, man, Jesus gets it. Uh, and Jesus took up a question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him. They beat him up. They fled, leaving him half dead. A priest, someone who speaks my word, someone who should know me, happened to be going down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Doesn't stop, just keeps going. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, on his journey, came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, poured on olive oil and wine. Then he put him in his own animal and brought him to, uh, to an inn. He took care of him. The next day he took two denarii, uh, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him when I come back. Uh, take care of him when I, can, when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever you extra spent. Which of these three do you think proved the neighbor of the man who fell in the hands of the robbers, the one who showed mercy to him? Go and do the same. Oof. A priest knew everything in the Old Testament. A Levite knew quite a bit. But then a Samaritan comes along. Who is our neighbor church? What, the believer whose heart's been set ablaze sees every opportunity to speak about Jesus. Because here's a gospel type point. That Samaritan was Jesus Christ for you as you were laying on the road. What does that mean? We're no longer bound to the Old Testament law, but we are bound to the law of Christ, which is love. Love. And it only comes from the heart that's that revelation of who Jesus Christ is, who he was, who he will be, and how we've been set free. Here's my illustration. Judge Caprio. Who knows Judge Caprio? Yes. Go to Facebook if you have social media. Judge Caprio. Go to Google and, and search him out. Judge Caprio is a judge on the, I think, New Jersey that is known for his mercy. Like if you get Judge Caprio, it's like, boom, I'm being set free, baby. He, he, he gives mercy to people who have no way of out of their bondage. And he says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce this for you. Some scot free, some just pennies on the dollar. Judge Caprio the most merciful judge is what they say until you take advantage of him. For instance, there's been people who have been set free from him only for a parking violation only to return three months later who has 10 more parking violations. Their heart wasn't transformed. His mercy turns into justice. Let me just read this for you guys and we'll pray. As Christians... We don't offer the Jewish sacrifices. Pay attention. We don't offer the Jewish sacrifices, 613 laws. But many people offer the modern sacrifices. They go to church on some Sundays. They'll give to the church. They'll even volunteer occasionally. They call themselves Christian and generally agree with the conservative doctrine. They certainly don't commit the big sins as other people. So they consider themselves good people. Yet these people gossip and they lie. They commit blasphemy and idolatry and adultery. They value their horse, or their horse, they value their house, their car, 
They value their family members, they value their jobs, their friends, their status, their kids' sports more than they value God. They claim to be living for God, but are actually living wicked lives. Such people must be warned. If you forget God in your daily life, God will one day tear you apart with his wrath and nothing will be able to save you. But if you humble yourself today by surrendering to Jesus Christ as Savior and following the commands of your Lord, then you are saved from his wrath to come. Church, there's two umbrellas. There's two umbrellas this morning. There's the umbrella of self-righteousness and there's an umbrella of Jesus. The person who stands underneath the umbrella in Jesus, though we respect the Ten Commandments, we're not bound. We're forgiven in the blood of Christ, but the person who sits underneath the umbrella of self-righteousness and believes that we can clean ourselves off before a sovereign king is judged by the Ten Commandments on that day to come with his wrath. The question is, which one are you under? And the hope is that if you're under the self-righteousness, you can quickly walk over to underneath Jesus Christ with your faith in his work and not yours. Glory to you, Lord God. Praise you, Lord Jesus, because you set us free. Lord God, when there was no way, I say it all the time, you made the way. Father, it's not just your work on the cross. It's not just you overcoming the grave. Lord God, Jesus, it's because you lived out the perfect life. Jesus, you walked out all 613 laws perfectly. I pray, Lord God, if there's people here who don't truly know you, Lord, I pray that they experience your grace. Jesus, that's what you're offering the period of grace to come to salvation in you and your redemptive work. And it's not in ourselves, but it's all of you, and we thank you for that. I pray as we leave today, Lord God, that the message of hope, that the, the message of salvation goes forth, Lord God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you give us divine wisdom on when to speak and how to speak to people. Lord God, I pray that when we just need to bandage up a wound, that when we need to give money to the person, that as you showed at the Samaritan, that we just do that. Because love transforms the dead heart. Father, we thank you. We worship you. And I pray a blessing over all these people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you guys next week at 930. Uh, my friend will be coming in to preach. It will be good. And you guys can sleep if you want. Just kidding. Be blessed. <laughs>